you would turn with me in uh, your copy of God's Word to the book of Acts. Uh, the Acts of the Apostles, we'll be looking at chapter 2, verses 1 through 21 this morning. Acts 2, verse 1 through 21. Acts 2, 1 through 21, let us give our attention to the reading of God's Word. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them, and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So far, the reading from God's Word this morning, may He add its blessing to our hearts. We are a Reformed Church, self-consciously Reformed. We believe uh, that's a biblical approach to what God's Word teaches. Uh, one of the drawbacks of the Reformed Church as of late has been a neglect of the Holy Spirit and His work. And this has not always been the case. Uh, John Calvin, who uh, many associate with the foundation of uh, Calvinism, and that's true at various levels, but not completely true. He was known as the theologian of the Holy Spirit. Uh, his very well-known work, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, uh, has divided into four books, and book three and four uh, are very much uh, saturated with the work of the Holy Spirit in light of the ministry of Christ and the effect that he has on his church. So whatever bad reasons we may have today as Reformed people for failing to mention the Holy Spirit and His ministry among His people, today's passage does not allow us to escape it, and we're thankful for that, that we are able in our passage today to look at the Holy Spirit and His work. And what we see in our passage today is that the Holy Spirit is poured out in an increasing measure to equip all the saints to declare the mighty works of God. And so to learn that lesson today, we want to first look at the coming of the Holy Spirit in verses 1 through 4. Then we want to look at the experience of the people in response to that coming of the Holy Spirit in verses 5 through 13. And they will want to see the significance of the event as Peter interprets the prophecy of Joel for us in verses 14 through 21. So the Holy Spirit is poured out in increasing measure to equip all the saints to declare the mighty works of God. First, we're going to see the coming of the Holy Spirit. Then we're going to see the experience of the people. And finally, we're going to see the significance of the event. So we'll begin by examining the coming of the Holy Spirit as it's laid out for us 
in verses 1 through 4. It says, uh, in order to give us ourselves a sense of timing, uh, the day of Pentecost has arrived. That's 50 days after the Passover is celebrated. Now, that was true of the Jewish people before Christ died on the cross. Christ died on the cross at Passover, and so it's 50 days after Jesus' death, but it was already being celebrated, this celebration of, pa of Pentecost. It's not a, a new celebration, unique to the New Testament. Now, in the New Testament, the reason for celebrating Pentecost will be reinterpreted, but the celebration of Pentecost uh, on its own was not entirely new. It was established in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 16, verse 9 speaks of the Feast of Weeks, which is to be celebrated 50 days after the Passover. And so what was required of the Jewish people during the Feast of Weeks is that they would come with free will offerings. It was a, somewhat of a celebration of, of harvest. And so the people of Israel were required to come to Jerusalem to present their free will offerings at the temple, the place where God's name dwells. So that means that Jerusalem was swollen with people during the Feast of Pentecost. It's one of the three main festivals that Israel was to observe. And so uh, the, 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 the Jerusalem, uh, the, bo the borders of Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem, packed with people, also with the 120 disciples of Christ. They were told to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit had been poured out. The promised Holy Spirit arrived, and, and He hadn't arrived yet. So the people uh, who followed Christ were also in Jerusalem waiting for the promised Holy Spirit. And our narrative today tells us that without any warning whatsoever in advance, now the Holy Spirit arrives. That He arrives uh, with a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And, and you see that in verse 2. You notice in verse 2, it doesn't say that a mighty rushing wind came, but that the sound of a mighty rushing, rushing wind appeared, and it was localized. You notice that also. It filled the house where they were sitting. The place where the disciples were, that room was filled with a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It's only in the house where the disciples are staying. Perhaps they're in the upper room. We, we don't know that for sure. But beyond the sound of the mighty rushing wind, we see in verse 3 that another sign appears. Divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. Now, I remember as a boy with my parents doing family worship. And part of what my parents did for family worship is when you were very little, they give you a little craft to do. My mom was a fairly crafty individual in the best sense of the word. And, and she had made for us a, a little... I don't know, a little colored piece of paper, and she had cut out different disciples, and we glued the disciples on the, on the pieces of paper. And then she had cut out for us fire, and we put fire on the, the, on the disciples. Now, that makes an impression on a young boy. The disciples are on, on fire. Well, the passage doesn't say that's exactly what happened. It says that tongues as a fire appeared and rested on the disciples. So, uh, like the wind wasn't wind, it was the sound like a rushing mighty wind, and, and the fires are not real fire, they are tongues like fire uh, that are resting on the uh, disciples of Christ. Uh, Luke is trying to give to Theophilus an idea of what things were like on that day. He's writing to somebody, and when he's, you're writing a book, it's hard to imagine exactly what things looked like or sounded like in that moment. And so Luke is giving some uh, descriptions. And he, he says the Holy Spirit came and His coming is to be recognized by the disciples not only because of what they see, these tongues as a fire, but also by what they hear, this sound of the mighty rushing wind. The ear hears the special sound. The eye sees the special appearing of the, dividing, the divided tongues like fire. And, and these signs, they say, Pay attention. This is not usual. Something special is going on right here, right now, in this particular moment. Rather than, than just giving the descriptions, though, he doesn't just say what happened to the disciples. He tells us the significant event that followed the announcement of the fire and the, uh, the tongues of fire and the, and the sound of the mighty 
rushing wind. In verse 4, Luke sets before us the significance of the event. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit is poured out, and, and one of the results of His arrival is the speaking in tongues of the disciples. The, sounds, the signs announce that the Holy Spirit is coming, and that leads to the specific result, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit manifests through the speaking in tongues of the disciples. Now, in order to make sense of what's going on here in this passage, in these first four verses, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we have to understand the work of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, in all of redemptive history. Because the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not the first action of the Holy Spirit. He's not a, a New Testament addition to the Trinity. He always was and He always has been working. And his work is recorded in Scripture right from the beginning. We get to the second verse in all of Scripture, and there we find the Holy Spirit. When you uh, go to Genesis 1, we know Genesis 1 to be the chapter of God's Word that deals with the creation. It says there, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the of the waters the spirit the holy spirit he's he's hovering over the chaos of the unformed substance all the preparatory work that god had done in creating all matter the holy spirit is hovering over that before god begins his creative work all of this taking place on the first day of creation there the holy spirit is already present in genesis 1 and verse 2 but we see the holy spirit throughout the Old Testament, not only at creation. It's not like the Holy Spirit is just there at creation, energizing matter, and then He takes some time off until He has to come in Acts 2 because He's going to be busy in the New Testament. Here the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is being recorded in His work uh, throughout the Old Testament. And so you see it in places like the book of Judges, where, uh, uh, where Othniel and Gideon and, and Samson are all described as being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, the King Saul, the apostate king later on, at one point in 1 Samuel 10 and verse 6, is described as being filled with the Holy Spirit that he might prophesy. In addition, in the Old Testament, you see the prophets in Isaiah and Ezekiel being described as being filled with the Holy Spirit. In those particular instances, it seems that these kings and judges and, and prophets are, are, are receiving a special gifting, a special anointing uh, to help them with a, a specific task to which they have been called by God. And the Holy Spirit is a source of power for these kings, these prophets, these judges in the Old Testament. But there's something more uh, in the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And that shows up in several places. I want to only uh, think of one. I want to think specifically uh, of Psalm 51. The Holy Spirit's work must include an abiding present to restrain sin in the life of the believer. Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament believer and the New Testament believer are redeemed by the same Savior, by the same way, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when sin is committed, when sin is committed in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is grieved. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is grieved. The only difference is degree and perspective. Now, let me explain that a little bit. Perspective in the sense that the Old Testament believer looks ahead to what Christ will accomplish and anticipates the fulfillment of the promise of God in Christ. The New Testament looks back. It sees in the rearview mirror, in a sense, what Christ has already done. But both Old Testament and New, New Testament person must receive what they know by faith. They must receive it by faith. Now, who works faith in the heart of man? The Holy Spirit works faith in the heart of man. And that's why in Psalm 51, verse 11, David pleads. He pleads with God that he would not take his Holy Spirit away as a, as a result of his sin. This is the cry of David, a recognition that the Holy Spirit is abiding in him. And he's pleading with God, God, I have sinned against you willfully, willfully, 
presumptuously, do not remove your Holy Spirit who dwells in me. Do not remove him from me. Do not take him away as a result of my sin. So the coming of the Holy Spirit, it's, it's not a brand new activity uh, from among the Trinity. It's not the third person being introduced into the life of the believer. But there is an increase in degree in the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as in the Old Testament, He's giving power for a specific task. But who's receiving that power now? Is it reserved for the king? For one among millions? Is it reserved for the prophets? However many prophets we have in our Old Testament Bible, the office of a prophet was rare in the Old Testament. Was it for the judges who, who required an, a special anointing during a specific season in their lives? Is it reserved for one or two among the million? No, now God gives His Spirit to the entire church. He pours it out on all the church. It says in verse 4 that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The people who receive His power are now expanded beyond what you saw in the Old Testament uh, manifestations. The church is being equipped to do what God set it apart to do, to bear witness to the work of Christ. So we see the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now let's examine together the experience of the people. I'm not talking about the experience of the disciples. I'm talking about the experience of the people who were dwelling in Jerusalem who witnessed uh, what took place on the day of Pentecost. Uh, we see here in this particular passage of Scripture uh, uh, that we're studying this morning a, div uh, uh, a record of the first witness-bearing efforts of the Church of Christ. The first step of the Church of Christ doing what He had set them apart uh, to do. The first declaration of the Church is recorded here in chapter 2 of Acts. Now, the sound, uh, as we see in verse six, 6, the sound of that room was not lost on the rest of Jerusalem. They heard the sound as of a mighty rushing wind, and it says that they gathered around that sound. The people who are gathered from Jerusalem, we know from verse 5 that these are the devout ones. These are the people who took their Jewish faith seriously. These are the ones who have traveled from around the world to come to Jerusalem to set their free will offering before the God of the Old Testament, who is the God of the New Testament as well, of course, but they just don't understand Him as they should. People from all over the world are, are gathered for that purpose, for the purpose of worship, and they hear this sound on the day of the Feast of Weeks, the day of Pentecost, and they gather, and it says in our passage that they are bewildered in verse 6. But they're not confused or bewildered because of the sound. What does it say in our passage? It doesn't say that they're confused because they hear this sound that is unusual. They're bewildered because they hear everyone speaking in their own native language. People from all over the world are hearing the disciples speak their own native language. In verse 4, it says that the, the filling of the Holy Spirit resulted in the speaking in other tongues. You see that there in verse 4? As the Spirit gives to all the disciples utterance, they speak in, in other tongues. Now this phrase, speaking in tongues, has Christian cultural baggage in our day. Uh, theologically, uh, we would call our modern understanding of tongue speaking glossalia, and that's simply a derivative from the Greek word that, that means tongues. So there is a, a sense in our own understanding, we bring that baggage to this word when we approach it. And glossalia, or speaking in tongues as we understand it in the church today, is an ecstatic speech. It's, a, it's an incomprehensible speech, simply a uh, an ecstatic, ecstatic utterance by one who is carried away uh, by, uh, ostensibly, by the Holy Spirit. And, and this kind of understanding of speaking in tongues was popularized by the charismatic movement of the last uh, several hundred years. But that's not what's being described here in Acts 2. What we're approaching in Acts 2 is, is not an ecstatic speech that is incomprehensible. It's not a, a use of, of glossalia. It says in, in, in verse 4 that they began to speak in other tongues 
That, they, that means they were already speaking in a tongue. Before the Holy Spirit came, they were already speaking in a tongue. Now, what tongue was that? It was Hebrew. Hebrew is the other tongue that the disciples were speaking at first. Now with the Holy Spirit coming, they're speaking in other tongues. They were speaking Hebrew, but now they're beginning to speak in other tongues. Tongue in the Greek language is simply another way of saying language. They're speaking in other languages. They were speaking Hebrew, but now they're speaking all sorts of other language. And, and verse 6 bears that out, doesn't it? They're amazed not by the sound, but they're amazed because everyone is hearing the disciples speak in his own language. There were 120 disciples. It tells us that in Jerusalem. There were 120 disciples, and each of them was speaking in another language as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. That, my brothers and sisters, that is what mystifies the devout Jews who are gathered in Jerusalem at the Feast of Weeks. It's not ecstatic speech. We should know when we describe ecstatic speech or glossalia as, as we think of it today. That is not uniquely Christian. That is not an outworking of the Holy Spirit necessarily. That is done in many religions naturalistic religions, pagan religions. They use glossalia, ecstatic utterances. But what is taking place here is not glossalia. What's taking, here, taking place here is the speaking in other language to all the devout Jews who are gathered under the sun in Jerusalem. There is the declaration of God's mighty works in previously unknown languages, unknown to the disciples. That is, God had divided language at one point, hadn't he? You remember back in Genesis 11, they're trying to do some construction project, and God says, now I'm going to divide their languages. And, and, and the people scatter. Well, now, because of the Feast of Weeks, all of them are brought together, and God overcomes the obstacle that he has put in place for man. He takes away the obstacle of language. He gives to the disciples the ability to speak in all sorts of languages. Why? So that they can tell a neat story to their children later? No, so that the mighty works of God would be declared to all the devout Jews who are gathered there. And so when you look at our, our passage here, verses 7 through 11, you see this great description of all the different places where these Jews have gathered from. Uh, Fifteen different languages might be represented. And, and the disciples, men from Galilee, fairly simple, not extraordinary people, fishermen, uh, certainly not, don't have access to Rosetta Stone material, right? They don't have that on their hard drive at the time. Uh, they know 15 different languages all of a sudden. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the disciples. And, and they're bearing witness to Christ, the mighty works of God. The crowd hears it. And what do they hear? The mighty works of God. Or another way to say that perhaps would be Christ and Him crucified. They hear of God entering into time and space and working redemption for His people uh, through faith. And the people, as they deal with their astonishment, as they deal with what they see and, and hear, they have two responses. In verse 12, it describes part of the group. It says, all were amazed and perplexed. So there's an astonishment. There's a, a wondering among some of the people who, who hear the speaking of these different languages. But that's not, the all is not everybody. Because it says later on in verse 13 that others are mocking. Others make fun of what they see. They, they see the disciples speaking in, their, in these different languages and what they say? They're, they're just a bunch of, of cheap drunks. They, they make light of, of the circumstance. Now, Sometimes as people, we do that. We make light of grave circumstances because uh, in our immaturity and in our shallowness, we don't know how to handle. Uh, we don't know how to handle these things, so, so we make light. I know an example of my own family, right? Uh, my parents uh, abandoned me in 1994. I was only 22, barely able to feed myself. I was just married. I had a, I had a daughter. And they moved from Toronto, Canada to, to Los Angeles, California. And I remember, is in June 1994, we had that, the next day they were leaving, and so the whole family gathered, right? My brother, my older brother and his family, we, we went to his house, and, 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 and I came with Lisa and, and Rachel, and, and we went to see my parents.
And we spent much of that night laughing and joking. Why? Because we didn't want to face what we knew was coming. We didn't want to face that we knew at one point we were going to have to say goodbye. And we were going to live thousands of miles apart, and we wouldn't be able to have these moments anymore. And so in part, although we do like to laugh with each other, in part, it's a denial, or it's, a, it's trying to cope with what you see, which you know is grave, which you know is serious. And here, these people in Jerusalem, supposedly devout, they turn, they see what is extraordinary. They turn and they see what is affirmed with great signs, the mighty sound of wind and, and the speaking of different languages previously unknown by these people. And they laugh at it. They make fun of it. They call them simply uh, cheap drunks. But P Peter, uh, the leading apostle at this particular moment, uh, doesn't let them get away with it. And he shows them the significance of the event, which is the last thing we want to see in our passage from verses 14 through 21. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 14 begins Peter's sermon. Now, Peter is not the only one who spoke on the day of Pentecost. He is simply the only one who is recorded. Here in, in chapter 2, you see Peter standing with the eleven, but already the people have said that they hear each one in his native language described for them the mighty works of God. So, they were already addressed, and now Peter is going to address them again. Peter's speech probably representative of what was being said by all the disciples at that particular time. But here in, in, verse Peter, uh, in verse 14, Peter begins his sermon, which continues uh, all the way through to verse 36. And in that sermon, we can divide it basically into two parts. Obviously, he hasn't gone to modern uh, seminaries because he would have known to divide it into three parts and, and have phonetically rhyming subpoints for each of his parts. But Peter's sermon can be divided into two parts. And the two parts that we can divide uh, Peter's sermon into is, first of all, the history of the event of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and then secondly, the call to repentance that comes from it. Now, this Lord's Day, we're only going to have time to look at the history of the event. And, and next Lord's Day, we will continue on, uh, the Lord willing, with the actual call to repentance that Peter issues. Now, but before Peter can address the history of the event of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. His first task is to refute the mockery. He's there, first of all, to refute that these people are just drunk. They're not to be taken seriously. This moment isn't grave at all. And uh, Peter, he, is, he seems to be a rough man. He was a fisherman. He probably was around uh, the darker side of man from time to time. And you see in his refutation something of his experience. Because Peter, when he refutes the mockery, he doesn't say, these people would never do that. What are you, crazy? They would never get drunk. That's not his answer. His, his answer isn't they wouldn't get drunk. His answer is it's too early for them to be drunk, isn't it? He says, it's only nine in the morning. Who gets drunk at nine in the morning? It's not, that's why he says it's unlikely that these people are drunk. It's not, it's not that it's not possible. Peter appeals to the likelihood of the moment due to the time. But what he does is, in, in removing the, op, the, the, the mockery, he doesn't allow the people to escape what is happening. It's not avoidable because of Peter's sermon. This day, this, this first day of Pentecost, celebrated as we understand it in the New Testament church, it's not the result of men in a drunken stupor, but this is the outworking of God and His promise of redemption. These words are fulfilling what was spoken by the mouth of the prophet Joel. That's where Peter starts in verse 16. This is what was uttered to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Joel. Now, what does a prophet do? A prophet declares the word of God. And so Peter is pressing these devout worshipers. What you see is the result of the God you claim to worship. The one that you have ostensibly gathered to worship in the giving of your free will offerings, he is the one who has brought this day about. Not some cheap wine. This is the work of God Almighty. And so, uh, in, in, uh, in appealing to the words of the prophets, he is, 
He is appealing really to the heart of the people who have gathered in Jerusalem at that particular time. And so what, what Peter does is in verses 17 through 21, he quotes Joel, the second chapter, and the 28th through the 32nd verse. And in this prophecy of Joel, we see the expansion in degree of the working of the Holy Spirit. It says there that sons and daughters shall prophesy in verse 17. Young and old shall see visions. Male servants and female servants will receive the Holy Spirit in that day. It's no longer something that's reserved to a very small group of people. But it's poured out, this, this equipping work of the Holy Spirit, it's poured out on all the church that they would bear witness to the work of Christ. All shall see visions. All shall prophesy. All shall declare the mighty works of God, which was, was, which what, was, which was what was taking place in Jerusalem that day. But more than just identifying an, aud an audience or, or on whom the Spirit will be poured out, it also marks the beginning of a particular era. And you see that in verse 17 of Acts 2. In the last days it shall be God declares. The last days. Why are these the last days? When did these last days start? I mean, if Joel is announcing the last days in verse 17, through the mouth of Peter, we've been in the last days for 2,000 years. That doesn't seem like a last days to me, but it is. Why do we call it the last days? Because if you think of God's plan of redemption and all that the Messiah has to accomplish in order to bring to perfection His people, everything is done. Christ's humiliation is complete. He was born under the Virgin. He was, he was born by the Virgin Mary. He was born under the law. He obeyed all of the law perfectly. He suffered at the hands of His creation. He hung on the cross in agony. He was buried. He died. And then His exaltation begun. His exaltation had begun. He was raised from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. And that, my friends, is the only thing that's missing. The only thing that's missing is that he hasn't returned yet. So we are in the last days because all that God needs to accomplish has been accomplished. We're only waiting for his return. Everything that the Lord has predicted has come to pass. In redemptive history, all is done except the return of Christ. And so the significance of this event is described by the prophet Joel. Uh, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of snow, uh, smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood. It hasn't happened. And we understand that it hasn't happened because Joel is a prophet. He is speaking prophetically. He's not speaking literally. He is speaking in, in what we would call hyperbolic language. It's the same kind of language that we use when we have a, a slice of pizza on Wednesday night at our family study. And we say, oh, this pizza, this pizza is the best pizza ever. It's not the best pizza ever. We're saying something using an exaggeration to express our delight in, in what we're eating. And so the same thing is true with the prophet Joel. He is using hyperbolic language. He is exaggerating to make the point. This is significant. There is a reason why the people of Jerusalem are amazed. There is a reason why they stand in awe of what's taking place. This is not normal. Something unusual is taking place. And Joel is simply using this kind of language to describe it. But what else does Joel say? He says that in the last days, all we're waiting for is one thing. All we're waiting for is one thing in verse 20. The day of the Lord. Now in the minor prophets, the reason, the reason preachers don't do a series where they carry through the minor prophets from start to end is because the minor prophets are all about the day of the Lord. Over and over and over again, this day of the Lord comes. And what is the day of the Lord for the Old Testament minor prophets? 
It's that day when the judgment of God will come down like a hammer on the people of Israel for all their obstinacy, for all their disobedience. And that day of the Lord in the Old Testament is a picture and shadow of the day of the Lord that will be when Christ returns on the clouds of heaven and He comes to judge the living and the dead. And He says, Jesus is saying, we live in the day that anticipates only that return, only that day. Christ will come to judge heaven and earth and He will do it in wrath and He will do it in mercy. And, and He here, Peter shows the only way that the mercy of God can be realized in verse 21. It says, It shall come to pass in that day that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All who call upon the Lord's name, those who have called on the Lord's name in the past, those who are calling on the Lord's day in the present, those who will call on the Lord's name in the future, they will be saved. That's the promise that Peter repeats here from Scripture. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, through faith in Christ alone. That's what Peter's talking about. He's talking about the only condition applied to the covenant of grace, faith. He's talking about faith. So the significance of the event that Peter sets before us is to ground us in redemptive history and to show us that in redemptive history, we anticipate only the return of Christ and that we are spared only by faith in Christ. So what do we take away from this passage as a congregation living in the last days for 2,000 years now? Well, the first thing that we learn is that the Holy Spirit is the affecting agent through His Word. Last Lord's Day, we looked at the foundational aspect of prayer to any healthy church. The disciples had devoted themselves to prayer. But here we see the disciples building on the foundation that's laid by prayer. It's built on the structure of prayer. And what follows here in this passage is not the prayers of the apostles, but the works of the apostles. The uh, apostles have devoted themselves to prayer and, and, and now they're working. Now they're declaring the mighty works of God in the very city where they were cowering up to this point because they were afraid of the Jews. Now they're engaged in, in street preaching. It's not, a very, it's not a very safe activity for the disciples of Jesus at that particular time. The disciples, they're focusing on the declaration of the word. They're not focusing on their programs. They're not, they're not focusing on a, a community movie night or other things like that. The works of the disciples are the Holy Spirit-empowered declaration of the mighty works of God. And the disciples, they're not approaching this declaration pragmatically. Or they're, not, they're not having a focus group. See what part of Jerusalem will receive the message better than the others. Which ones are more favorably disposed. Let me find the ones that I think will like it the best and, and tailor my message to them. They simply declare. They declare the mighty works of God. They're doing it through the Holy Spirit's strength, performing the task of the church. And that was the church's task then, and it's the church's task now. The declaration of the Word of God, the mighty works of God, is the calling of the church. That's the calling of Cliffwood Presbyterian Church as well. Just as prayer must be the foundation of any healthy church, so must be its commitment to the declaration of the mighty works of God. Now, the problem, of course, is that the church is always tempted to lose sight of this task. The church is always tempted to have what we would call mission creep. This is what God calls us to do. This line, all we have to do is, is, is go that way. And in time, we get knocked off a degree or two or 45. And before we know it, we're, we're heading off in a place where we're not called to go. 
providing for the poor, being a place of community, of friendship, bringing neighborhoods together, providing a safe environment. These may flow out of the church, but they are not the calling of the church. The calling of the church is to declare the mighty works of God. So, if Cliffwood Presbyterian Church ever becomes a place where God's word is not declared, we will be a failure. We will be an apostate church. We are called to declare the mighty works of God. Certainly here in the pulpit that's true, but it's also true of your lives. It's also true as of you as, as members of the body of Christ. Your calling is to declare the mighty works of God wherever you may be found. For some of you, you're doing that in your home with your children. For some of you, you're doing that in your workplace. For some of you, you're doing it as part of your ministry. But all of us are called to declare the mighty works of God. Not in the same way, not in the same forum, not with the same sophistication, not with the same words, but we're all called to declare the mighty works of God. And it's not a calculated activity for the Church of Christ based on ex expected returns. We don't engage in missions because we think that's going to be a good return on our money. Our tithing is going to increase, so we better get out there and do some missions. We don't do it that way. We do it because it is the command of God. It's a foundational obligation to declare Christ and Him crucified. Now, what will be the response to this declaration? It says in the Bible that it's a stumbling block for Jews and it's folly for the Greeks. We can expect that the declaration of the mighty works of God will be met with they're just a bunch of crazy drunks. They've had too much wine early in the morning. We can expect that it will be met with dismissal. But that's not our problem. Our problem is not how it's received. Our obligation is to, through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the church, declare the mighty works of God. It's the mission of the church, and we're to carry it out with diligence. And uh, I don't think we can leave this passage behind without, without stressing that the obligation for mankind is to call upon the name of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. He is your only hope for, the, for salvation. That is the exclusive claim of the Christian faith. It's what makes everybody mad at the Christian faith. There is no hope for you apart from Christ Jesus. There isn't anything anyone can do to be saved. Adam plunged the whole human race into a condition of guilt, both in our nature, what we would call our original sin, and in our actions, what we would call our actual transgressions, or our actual sins. That is the condition of mankind, and you can't get out of it. It's not possible. And so there's only one thing you can do, the Bible teaches. Call on the name of of the Lord. I think that's a, it's a, it's a bucket statement. It, it captures the gospel message, calling on the name of the Lord. It's a summary statement. Embedded is, in it is everything that gives me hope from Scripture. The perfect obedience of Christ. His willing sacrifice on the cross. His resurrection from the dead. His pouring out of His Holy Spirit. His sanctification in the life of the believer. And the sure knowledge that one day, we live in the last days, one day He will return. And he will judge the living and the dead. And what will He say to you, Christian? He will say, you are my righteous one. You are counted as righteous because you have called on the name of the Lord. Not because you are righteous in and of yourself, but because Christ's righteousness has been given to you. That's your only hope. Christ, His name, His righteousness imputed, credited to my account. And that's the message of the New Testament church. Right from the moment it first started, 
right from the moment when it first bore witness to the mighty works of God on the first Pentecost in Jerusalem in that day. So we live in the last days before the return of Christ when His Spirit is poured out on, on man to bear witness to Him. And this witness, because of the signs that accompany it, this witness is unmistakably from God as the Holy Spirit is poured out on His people. Through this Holy Spirit comes the message. Through this Holy Spirit comes the power. Through this Holy Spirit comes the conversion of the hearers. And the task of the church and all of it is perfectly clear. Declare the mighty works of God and see what He will do in your midst. Anything less is simply disobedience. Let's pray together.